I consider myself a Virginian, if not by birth, then by choice. My uh, son graduated from Charlottesville High School. I served as Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia for six years. My friends are here in this area. So for me, coming to this area is really homecoming. Sweetbriar is also a very important institution for the Commonwealth, historically, intellectually, and culturally. So I feel very honored to have been chosen as president of Sweetbriar. I think the community at Sweetbriar has spoken with one voice and very loudly. The students, staff, alumni, and uh, others, other supporters of Sweetbriar have all said that they want to see Sweetbriar persist, flourish, and thrive. I feel very honored to be part of the team to make sure that commitment comes into and becomes reality. And we want to be devoted to that commitment on the basis of excellence. Excellence in everything we do. So that uh, we can eventually fulfill the great vision of the founder, not just become a consequential college for women in this country, but for the world. I was always interested in analyzing social condition. I'm trained as a political scientist, but I think that there was a personal reason why I ended up being a scholar of economic development and social change. I grew up in a country that condensed about three centuries of Western experience into about 50 years. And it was a very rapid change. I was always fascinated by how people with determination and grit commit themselves to a rapid project of social progress and change. And so that's what got me interested uh, to continue studying social condition and they eventually go on to um, manage and run universities. Being a teacher in the classroom and being a leader, I think, are essentially same. When you're a teacher, you have to know what you're doing, but you also have to know your students. You need to know what their capabilities are. You need to know how they grow, what their aspirations are. And you want to bring out the best in them. And I think that's what leaders do. As a teacher, you have to learn how to communicate very effectively to and with your constituencies. I think liberal arts education is very, very important. To me, in my mind, I'm a very concrete person, and in my mind, liberal arts teaches you how to think logically, how to think in terms of cause and consequences, how to think in context, with sensitivity, with delicacy. It also teaches you um, how to express yourself profoundly and clearly. And I think it also teaches you how to appreciate beauty, which I think is very important. And I really don't see what part of that education isn't relevant for the world. I think women's education is incredibly important. You know, for the longest time, we have thought of women's education as a matter of access. You know, a lot of great uh, colleges, including Sweetbriar, got established in order to provide access to education to women because otherwise they, didn't, they, they couldn't have access to education. The mission of women's education today is different. It's not about access. Women can go to any college they want. But women's colleges offer, I think, very distinct kind of education, quality education, education that's focused on empowerment and leadership. And uh, I think that uh, Sweetbriar has a very important role to play in that regard. I came to America at 18 to go to college as a foreign student. 
And uh, the education I received at a very small liberal arts college was eye-opening. And I asked myself, why so? And, uh, you know, I didn't know what, at that time, critical thinking meant. I thought critical thinking meant you go around criticizing everything. So I went around and I criticized everything I saw. And, uh, but in the end, I realized, you know, what makes American education so great is the faculty. I think American faculty make the best faculty, best teachers in the world. And I think the reason is because American teachers, American faculty, take students and talk to them as adults. They respect the views of the students. They probe the questions together that might be in the minds of the faculty or students. And, um, and whatever the views the students might have, um, I think there is the attitude they need to be respected and explored. And I think that this is something that makes American education so utterly unique in many ways. The faculty are people that make the college, that they set the tone, and, um, you know, especially for Sweetbriar, which prides itself and is nationally known for its very fine teaching faculty, that, um, that uh, it'll be very important for me to work very closely with the faculty to make sure that that excellence, that reputation that uh, Sweetbriar has remains unharmed going forward. Sometimes in America, we become captives of our own narratives. One narrative that we're captive of is the narrative that says that women's education is obsolete, it's not relevant, it's not true. In the rest of the world, women's education is thriving, it's exploding in fact, because number of students enrolled in colleges doubled around the world in the last 16 years. And education of women has become a very important issue, and in many parts of the world, for cultural and religious reasons, that uh, people prefer women's colleges. Another narrative that we're captive of in this country is the narrative that liberal arts education needs to be defended, and that we need to struggle to make sure that people recognize liberal arts education as an indispensable part of the educational landscape of this country. Not so in the rest of the world. I think that countries where education is becoming far more important than ever before, such as China, Singapore, many parts of the world, they clearly recognize that liberal arts education done the American style is very important, very critical for teaching people critical reasoning skills, and that for their societies to progress and move forward, they need to educate more people in the liberal arts. You know, there is a saying that in colleges and universities, faculty only care about parking, and uh, alumni uh, only care about football. Well, at Sweetbriar, we don't worry about parking. There's plenty of parking space, and alumni certainly don't care about football. What they do care about is uh, the excellence and the mission of their college, and they have shown to the country and to the world that alumni can be very important and productive members of the college community and that they care about issues and institutions far larger than themselves. I would listen very carefully to them about what Sweetbriar means to them and what aspirations that they have for the college, and uh, what role alumni can play other than simply providing funds for the college. Because I think that um, we need to reinvent liberal arts colleges, and we need to be innovative about uh, how we see the role of uh, Sweetbriar for women's education going forward. And so I think that there could be very interesting role 
in place for alumni going forward. As I said earlier, I grew up in Korea until I was 13 years old, and then I, I uh, ended up in a high school in Tokyo. When I was growing up, I recall that, uh, let's say in 1960, Korea had uh, GMP per capita of about the same level as Uganda, but they had more students in college per thousand than in England. They care very deeply about education. When I was growing up, my father was uh, the first and only son uh, in the very large clan that he grew up in. And before I knew it, I had all these uncles and aunts coming to live with us so that they could go to school from there. They studied music, they studied sociology, they studied engineering, they studied Germanics. And uh, education made transformative impact in their lives. And uh, so it was very easy for me uh, in that regard to devote myself to higher education because I understood very intuitively the transformative power of education and how that can help you better your life chances. I went to a small liberal arts college called Bowdoin uh, in Maine. In so many ways, it is very much like Sweetbriar. But I'll tell you one thing that made a big impact on me when I first went to Bowdoin and when I first laid my eyes on Sweetbriar. I was a high school student going to international school in Tokyo, and believe it or not, it was a Spanish convent school. I was rifling through the pages of National Geographic. I came across a heart-stopping, beautiful picture of a house uh, in winter, shuttered for winter. And I took the magazine to uh, one of the nuns, and I said, Hermana, Hermana Maria Cruz, where is this place? It looks just beautiful. And she said, well, it's in a place called Maine. It's a very beautiful state. And um, if you want to study English literature, that's where you want to go. There's a school called Bowdoin. So beauty moved me when I first learned about that school. Likewise, when I first laid my eyes on the campus here at Sweetbriar, it simply took my breath away. And um, so I think beauty is what uh, uh, is the common tie between the two very small liberal arts schools, one that started me in this country and one that I'm about to, to embark on um, being part of. People talk about um, remembering where they were when JFK was assassinated. And I think perhaps alumni here can talk about where they were when they first heard the news of school's closure. I remember where I was. I was in, my, in the sunroom of my house, reading the New York Times and being shocked, just utterly shocked and speechless. And I was saddened by the closure. And later, when I heard about the um, determination of the alumni and the way that uh, they conducted themselves, I was really full of admiration. You know, I've read a lot of books on American higher education, and they're not always very interesting. But now I can say that the experience of Sweetbriar will be a very interesting chapter in the history of American higher education. I met a number of uh, Sweetbriar alumni through the search process. I'll tell you about uh, one person who made a deep impression on me. She was uh, telling me about what it was like to try to jumpstart the college that had closed down. She talked about how her colleagues, her friends, and uh, she came to came back to uh, their alma mater, trying to find uh, faculty who might still be there, trying to get some start, uh, classes started. And as she was talking about it, there was a pause 
And I looked at her, and here is an incredibly strong, elegant, accomplished woman. And I, and I saw her eyes well up with tears. Even recounting that history was painful for her because it was traumatic for her, as it was for a lot of people. And I thought, here are very, very strong women, and very accomplished, and very committed, and deeply concerned about causes bigger than themselves. The last two years have been absolutely fascinating. Uh, I work for a foundation called Open Society Foundations. And uh, given that in the last two years, the world was rocked by a refugee crisis emanating from the Middle East, I spent quite a bit of time to try to figure out how to educate the refugees. Now, normally, one doesn't think about higher education in association with refugees except that something has changed. When you look at a country like Syria, some 30% of relevant age group in Syria had been enrolled in universities. And so for them, uh, being in school isn't really a luxury anymore. It's something that people did in peacetime. And so we were trying to figure out how to deliver higher education to the refugees as best we can so that they have a better shot at a better future. And uh, that experience has been um, quite interesting. We supported refugee education in Turkey, in frontline states like Turkey, Lebanon, and, um, and Jordan. And uh, we also did something similar with refugees um, who are arguably one of the most persecuted minorities in the world residing in Bangladesh. They're called the Rohingyas. And uh, we uh, provided uh, opportunities for them, especially as they uh, settled in refugee camps in Bangladesh. Now, why do I mention that? Well, I believe very deeply that if you educate women, you educate generations. That you have a race of people who uh, have been kept down and who need to be lifted up. And therefore, it felt logical to uh, train a relatively large number of people as the shark force for, for leadership for next generation. So we did that. We uh, provided scholarship for 50 women to go to a college in Bangladesh called Asian Women's University. That was a very interesting experience. My husband is an academic. He has taught at the University of Chicago for the last 30 years. Well, actually, his father went to the University of Chicago, got his PhD from there. His mother got uh, her uh, degree from the University of Chicago as well. So it's a Chicago family in many ways. And, uh, you know, University of Chicago is uh, famously a school with high standards. And so that's what he cares about. He cares about high standards. And uh, I care about that too. And I think that as we, um, we uh, uh, embark on this journey for the future of Sweetbriar, uh, we uh, would be thinking very seriously about how to build the strength of Sweetbriar going forward upon excellence. We talk about universities all the time. Um, it's kind of our lives. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that my husband really cares very deeply about the liberal arts. He's a historian. He uh, cares very deeply about how to deliver the knowledge of history, how to get people to be more interested in history. And so, you know, that's uh, quite a bit of our dinner conversation. My son just graduated from the same school that I went. I think that um, intergenerational attendance in the same school is very important and, and wonderful thing. Um, my son did something that I 
I was not good enough to do at Bowdoin. He participated in theater in that college, and um, throughout his stay, he was either part of a group or led the group doing improv. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a wonderful preparation for um, any kind of career going forward.